Okay, tonight's speaker is um, Father Christopher Collins. Um, he's a Jesuit from St. Louis U. And here's a little bit about his background. After attending Jesuit schools in Phoenix and in Dallas, Father Collins took part in a service trip to El Salvador before his freshman year in college. There he discovered a love for service and community and the faith. So he fostered that interest by taking philosophy and theology classes when he got to college, gaining an understanding of intellectual elements of the Catholic faith. As a Jesuit, he served the Lakota people in South Dakota as a teacher and then later as a parish pastor. At St. Louis University, Father Collins taught theology and served as director of the Catholic Studies program. Today, Father Collins serves as the St. Louis University's assistant to the president for mission and identity. In this role, Father provides executive level leadership for fostering and promoting St. Louis U's Catholic Jesuit identity in its operations and structures, its programs and practices. So tonight, um, Father Collins will share his thoughts on the mystery of suffering. Well, good evening. Thanks very much for the invitation to be with you. Um, what are we, uh, just having gone through those stations of the cross and, and offering our own hearts to the heart of Jesus and allowing him to open his heart to us, let's just continue our, our prayer and that desire uh, to join our hearts both in the joys as well as the sorrows of our lives and of our world and find our true confidence and peace in friendship with him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, we praise you and thank you for our lives and for the great desires you've placed in our hearts to come to know you and love you and serve you. And we just ask you to pour out your spirit upon us this evening and stir up your spirit within us so that we can awaken those desires to to really more freely and more generously follow you and offer your love in our world, especially to those who most need to receive it. And we pray all this as your beloved sons and daughters, praying as your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it is nice to be with you and my first time here at St. Angela's, so a great, great privilege for me to be here. And I thought uh, it was suggested that it might reflect a little bit on the mystery of suffering, the mystery of our own human suffering, the mystery what I'd like to kind of focus on a bit more is the mystery of Jesus' suffering and desire to be with us. And, and I was struck, I don't know if you had a chance to go to Mass today, but the reading for today in the Book of Wisdom, I'm going to kind of use that as a little bit of a springboard for some reflections this evening. And it struck me because, in part, as a Jesuit, and some of you might be familiar with some of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, but that's a way of, of, of praying, and it's basically a kind of a retreat format to come to know the person of Jesus in a new and more personal and intimate way so that we can follow him more freely, and, and including following him into, the, into his own passion and into his own death. And at, the be and at the beginning of each of the sections of the spiritual exercises, there's four weeks, he calls it. Uh, the first week is recognizing my own sin. The second week is, is trying to follow Jesus in his, in his ministry, being attentive and paying attention to how he interacts with people and brings about healing and, and encouragement and, and so on. But then in the third week of the exercises, it's about the passion and the death of Jesus. And at the beginning of each one of those weeks, St. Ignatius suggests to the person making the retreat to ask for a grace. And, to, and what, but just by asking for the grace, that already opens us up to receive it. But he says he gets pretty specific about the kind of 
grace to ask for. And in the third week of the spiritual exercises that, that is going to meditate on the passion and death of Jesus, he suggests that the people who pray with this, pray with the passion, and try to really pay attention to, <clears throat> to who Jesus is and how he's, how he's operating and how he's interacting and so on and how he's constantly attentive to the Father's love for him, he asks, he asks us to ask for the grace of, con, among other things, of confusion. In the, in the third week of the exercises with the passion of Jesus, he says, ask for the grace of, of shame and confusion that my Lord would go to die for me. How could this, how could he be doing this for me? Why would he be doing it? And, and for just any one of us, but me personally, not just for the world, not just generally, uh, that he's doing this, but how could he be doing this for me? That's confusing, right? Why would he go to those sort of depths just for a regular Joe like me or Jill or whatever the case may be, right? Why would he be doing it? I and, and also, what does it accomplish that he would be doing this for me? And it's kind of an interesting suggestion that he makes for the spiritual life explicitly asking for a grace of confusion. <laughs> and that seems kind of weird, kind of strange, but maybe it's also awfully realistic too for us as human beings. A lot of our lives are characterized by confusion. I don't know about you, but there's a lot of confusing things that happen. We do a lot of confusing things that don't make sense. <laughs> We react in certain ways to things that happen in life in confusing ways that don't make sense. We'd like to think we're rational all the time. Maybe we're very rarely rational, actually. Maybe a lot of the time we're not making a lot of sense and the people around us aren't making a lot of sense. And, and things break down. Uh, that's part of the mystery. If we're gonna talk about the mystery of Jesus' suffering, Part of what we also want to consider is the mystery of the human condition and specifically the mystery of our own sin, the mystery of sin itself, the mystery of evil, actually. It doesn't make sense that we do the things we do to one another in the human family. Terrible, horrendous things that we do to each other. It doesn't make sense that we turn away from God, for example who gives us life. You know, that's kind of confusing. In the, in, even in the book of Genesis, to go way back to the beginning of our, the story of our humanity, you recall the, those two stories of the creation of, of Adam and Eve, the very great care that God does day by day, putting things together in creation. Little by little, separating out the light from the darkness, separating out land from the water, creating little crawling things and flying things and grass and plants and trees and whatnot, right? The great care that he does to bring about all of creation and then at the very center, at the culmination of creation, at the pinnacle of it all, God says, let us make man in our image. Let's, let's make man and woman in our, in our image and likeness so that, we, so that they can love each other and so that they can love God, right? Let's give those human beings unique powers to know and to love that no other crawling things or creeping things have on the face of the earth, right? Let's give a unique dignity a unique set of gifts to these human beings, to Adam and Eve. And then it's all set up. <laughs> They're all set up in that garden, Adam and Eve. And, and it lasts for a little while, not even like half a day. <laughs> but the way things are set up in the garden as the story unfolds, you know, if you think about it, for Adam and Eve, the only thing they have to do is just receive what's given from God, right? The whole garden is all set up. There's a lot of beautiful things to look at. There's plenty to eat. And they've got each other too, to look upon in love 
and to enjoy each other, to receive each other's love and friendship and so on, and even friendship with God. You know, and we get, and we get a glimpse of it later on. As the story goes, it, it turns out God used to, in the story, in the garden, God used to take a stroll with them in the breezy time of the day, apparently. Right? The, he'd join Adam and Eve in a nice part of the day that was breezy, and they'd just walk through that garden together and just enjoy everything. Just look at everything, chat, enjoy each other. They have no responsibilities whatsoever. <laughs> they don't have to go to work. They don't have to set any appointments. They don't have to answer the phone. They don't have to work around the house. <laughs> They're just receiving everything that's given. Can you imagine? It's your only job, day in, day out, is just receive what's given. And then that evil spirit gets in there and messes everything up and starts to tempt and starts to drive a wedge in between Adam and Eve and in between them and God and them and creation. That little voice that gets in there and that starts to make them doubt what, how good God is, actually. Remember, he, asks, he says to Eve, he, tries to, he hooks Eve into that conversation. Did he really say don't eat from any of the trees? He kind of goes to the extreme, the evil one. Kind of messes with her mind a little bit. Did he really say you can't eat from any of these trees? And then she, she gets hooked into that conversation with, with Satan, with that serpent. And then she's kind of, at first, kind of a defending God. Says, well, no, it's not all of the trees. It's just that one tree. But by this time, he's got her hooked <laughs> in that conversation. And then once she's hooked, then the, the enemy, the serpent, Satan, gets more bold and says, you're certainly not going to die if you do this, right? So he calls God a liar, essentially, and, call, and plants a little seed of doubt in her mind about how good God is in the first place. And then she starts to think to herself, wait a minute, I guess this has been okay up until now, but maybe, maybe he's been holding back on me. Maybe he's been, maybe he's been holding back on us and, and he doesn't want us to be, to be, have real dignity. And it, this is the confu this is one of the confusing parts of that story, I think, because he says, if you do go, Satan, the serpent, if you do go for that, that fruit of that one tree, he doesn't want you to do it because if you do it, you're going to be like God. And that kind of catches her attention and, and Adam's attention. And they say, yeah, we want to be like God. And so God's been holding back something good from us. And this is where the story gets very confusing. Because the promise that the enemy, Satan, gives to them, if you go grasp that fruit, you're going to be like God. The confusing and strange thing is they were already like God. Just a few verses earlier, remember God said, let us make man and woman in our image and likeness. Let's make these people <laughs> in, to be like God. They were already like God. And there's something strange that the, that the temptation gets in there to say, go take matters into your own hands and grasp that fruit, and then you'll be like God. So there's a strange kind of forgetting that they go through, and they forgot who they already were. Isn't that kind of curious? They forgot who they already were. They forgot the dignity that they had to be like God from day one. <laughs> and we, too, forget. We forget the dignity that we have already, right? And we spend a lot, probably, of our time and our lives grasping after other things the esteem of others or wealth or power or whatever it might be, pleasures to make us feel better and to make us feel like we've, we, we make our own dignity when in fact the dignity is already given to us, right? Isn't that kind of curious? We forget who we already are. And, you know, if this gets kind of poignant, I think with those of you who have raised kids and grandkids, I suppose, 
in some ways, that's the frustrating part of kids, I would imagine, maybe especially teenagers, that they, they get all wound up and insecure and afraid and anxious and worried about how they're perceived by other people. And they start doing all sorts of other things to try to fill that void when they don't even realize they've somehow have forgotten. This is part of the human condition, I think. They kind of have forgotten the, the gift of who they are already the many gifts that they, they don't think they have any gifts too often, a kid, teenager, maybe especially. Maybe that lasts a long time in life, right? That we kind of forget those gifts that we already have. But anyway, there's something interesting, I think, and confusing about our, our human condition, and it goes all the way back to chapter three of the Genesis, the very first bit of the Bible, right? In understanding who we are. We're confused right off the bat in our human condition. And, and that confusion has pretty, pretty nasty consequences, right? After they're stuck in that confusion, and then God comes to them, you remember in the, in the garden, and says, hey, where, where are you guys? <laughs> this is the time when we take that walk in the breezy time of the day. And he asks, where are you? Where are you? What, what happened? And then they're hiding. Why are you hiding from the one who's given you everything, right? Why are you hiding? Why are you ashamed? Why are you ducking out from the one who gave you everything to begin with? That doesn't make sense, right? That's a confusing response that Adam and Eve have. Adam and Eve have. It's a confusing response that I think we have, maybe. Sometimes if things go badly, maybe especially by our own sin, if we feel regret or shame about something that has gone on in life, we actually want to go, f we've already made a little bit of a separation from God. And then because of our shame, we want to go even farther away from God and start to think to ourselves, maybe God doesn't even want me around. And I'm just going to hide farther and farther and farther into darkness and, and self-pity, maybe. Bitterness, because hard things happen in life. Sometimes that's confusing. Exactly at the time when we most need God, maybe, strangely enough, we run the other way. Why do we do that kind of thing? <laughs> Why are we so confused? <laughs> but that's part, of our, that's part of our human condition, right? We do things that don't make sense. We retreat away from God who has given us everything, and who wants to call us back, and yet we go the other direction. Why is that? I don't know. <laughs> this is the mystery part of the, of the story. There's a mystery about evil. There's a mystery about sin. Why do we do the things that we do? And I think this is, part, this is important to actually not really come up with any answers to it either, but more just to have a sense of wonder at this confusion that we can sometimes get ourselves into. Why am I like this? <laughs> and talk to the Lord about it. Don't hide from the Lord, but instead talk to the Lord about why am I doing the things that I do? <laughs> why do I make things hard on myself? Why do I make things hard on the people I love? That's confusing. <laughs> sometimes the people who are closest to us in love, in family, in a marriage, with kids, sometimes, not sometimes, maybe all the time. Maybe we are hardest on the people that are closest to us. Why? <laughs> Why are we like that? Right? We can be so, and, 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 and this is probably true for a lot of us, maybe, in our kids and grandkids and so on. At least my nieces and nephews. Lots of their neighbors and parents, friends, they think these are great kids. <laughs> They're so well-behaved and so polite. And then their parents say, well, that's not the kid I recognize at home. How come they're, I guess they're good outside the house, but not so hot inside the house. What's going on? The closer we get into the places of great, where, there's, where there is great love, there's also great hurt that we cause one another. That, that's mysterious, right? That causes, that's a place of wonder maybe for us to ask God about, why do I do that? Maybe this is the kind of thing to be bringing in to confession, actually, <laughs> and not to try to have a clear answer about it all, 
but just say, I don't know why I do the things I do like this. Hurting the ones that are close to me, perhaps. Running away from God when I most need God. I don't know what to do with it, but Lord, here it is. <laughs> this is who I am. That's, that's maybe, I think maybe part of the gift of that, that praying for the grace of confusion within the third week or during Lent, perhaps, is to bring a lot of this jumbled up confusion about who I am and why I do the things that I do, just to bring it before the Lord and say, I don't know what to do with this, <laughs> but Lord, help me, <laughs> right? Just help me. And, and that's, a great, that's a place of great holiness, to be bringing that place of confusion to the Lord. And, you know, I was thinking earlier, um, I mentioned briefly that there was that reading today from the Book of Wisdom, and I want to just go back over that again. This is another version of the, of the confusion of, of the Passion, and that it comes up during, during Lent. This book, uh, the reading from the Book of Wisdom, that's strange, but true, I think. It says, the wicked said among themselves, thinking not aright. <laughs> Once you're in that place of wickedness or separation from God, you're not thinking, I'm not thinking aright, right? I've got a skewed vision of things. But this is what they say, the wicked, when they're talking amongst themselves, muttering amongst themselves. Let us beset the just one because he is obnoxious to us. Let us attack, let us beset the one who is just because he is obnoxious to us. He is poison to us. The one who is just is poison to the one who is wicked. Noxious. <laughs> Strange. It's true though, right? And this is what they plan to do. Let us beset him because he is obnoxious to us. He sets himself against our doings, reproaches us for our transgressions of the law, and charges us with violations of our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and styles himself a child of the Lord. But to us, he is the censure of our thoughts. Merely to see him is a hardship for us. If I'm in a place of separation from God, a place of sin, a place of hardness of heart, even to see the one who is just, Jesus ultimately, even to see him is a hardship for us. He judges us debased. He holds aloof from our paths as from things impure. He calls blessed the destiny of the just and boasts that God is his father. But then here's a further element of confusion here, to me at least. So the, it's very clear that the wicked don't like to be around the one who's just. <laughs> it causes hostility to come out of them. But then they say, let us see whether his words are true. Let's test this. Let's find out what will happen to him. For if the just one be the son of God, he will defend him. God will defend him and deliver him from the hand of his foes. With revilement and torture, let us put him to the test that we may have proof of his gentleness and try his patience. Let's test him and see what happens. Let's see if God saves him. Let's see if he really is truly gentle and loving, even though that's exactly what we think is noxious to us. Weird, right? But let's do that. This is the plan of the wicked. And let's condemn him to a shameful death, for according to his own words, God will take care of him. These were their thoughts, but they erred, for their wickedness blinded them. They had a blindness, a skewed vision, a distorted view of reality. And they knew not the hidden counsels of God, and neither did they count on a recompense of holiness, nor discern the innocent soul's reward. I don't know about you, but that whole, that whole passage from wisdom that always comes up during Lent 
is very strange. Here, it's strange on a few different levels to me, or confusing on a, on a few different levels. First of all, even though it's very true, why is that? For the one who is just, ultimately Jesus, but we get glimpses of it in our, in our own lives. Sometimes when we're most ornery, sometimes when we're hurting a lot, maybe for some reason, Maybe when we're most frustrated or we most feel so far away from goodness or being loved. And then you see somebody else who seems to be good and holy. Do you ever had this experience? If you're honest with yourself, you kind of resent them. <laughs> you re Sometimes if I'm ornery and feeling sorry for myself and I see somebody else that's happy, and joyful, it's irritating. Isn't that odd? <laughs> Isn't that, I remember early on in my vocation, uh, when I'm still kind of getting used to the celibacy and no marriage, no family, all these kinds of things. I remember going for a walk in St. Paul, Minnesota, would go around the neighborhoods, and I was spending a lot of time wrestling around with whether that's really my vocation and this isn't what I really had in mind because I wanted to get married and have kids, but I also had this other calling and I'd sometimes I'd see these little couples with their kids and their strollers and looking so happy and I just got mad. <laughs> That's weird. That's off. That's a skewed vision, right? But it was more about me feeling sorry for myself in those in that moment, right? I resented other people's happiness occasionally. I'm sorry to admit. Right? But maybe we do weird things like that. When we come into the presence of goodness or beauty, sometimes if we're in a place of darkness, in a place of self-pity, in a place of feeling ornery, the last thing I wanna do is be around somebody who's good <laughs> and holy and joyful, genuinely joyful. I wanna get those people out of there. I wanna go mope around with other people that are, that are bitter like me, right? Sometimes we do weird things like that. We want to just complain with other people. I don't want to hear anything good, right? I don't know why we're like that, but we are occasionally, at least. That's confusing. But very poignant when it comes to this reading from wisdom that's anticipating the, the confusion of the passion of Jesus. The wicked ones find Jesus a scandal. His love, his tenderness, his compassion, his mercy. Some people, including professionally religious people, <laughs> find him intolerable, right? And they kill him for it, ultimately, right? They cannot and will not let their own hearts be touched by him. They cannot and will not believe that God would come close to them in the flesh in Jesus, right? God is supposed to stay up there, <laughs> far away and transcendent. God is not supposed to get involved in the muck of our daily lives, right? That's unbecoming of God. That's scandalous for the people of Jesus' time. It's still scandalous, right? To think that God would enter into into ordinary human lives and the messiness of human lives. That's too much to believe, I think, for some people, for a lot of times. But that's true. And so there, there's something strange about people wanting to get away from Jesus. Peter does it in the Gospels, too. Remember after that big miraculous catch of fish, when, when Peter comes face to face with Jesus, who just made this miraculous catch of fish happen, What's Peter's response? Not, wow, this is incredible. Praise you, Jesus. He, instead, he says, go away from me because I'm a sinful man. That's sad, but true, right? Go away because I'm sinful. I don't belong here. I want to go far away from you. You know, there's another element of the confusion there. But if you kind of continue along this path, it actually gets more confusing in my mind. <laughs> An even greater gift of confusion is given. Let's say if you just follow this book of wisdom passage, but also follow the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus. 
though just one is toxic to them and they want to beset him, but part of what's going on there is they want to know if God is really going to come through here. Let's see if God really takes care of him. Let's see if his love and his mercy and his gentleness really continues to shine through. Because at an even deeper level, even in the heart of the wicked one, they and we still are looking for what is good (laughs) and looking for what is holy. Is it possible that there's actual genuine holiness and goodness in the world. (laughs) We're still, maybe, if you peel back several layers, we do a lot of confusing bad things, (laughs) but maybe it's also kind of interesting that way, 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 way deep down, we still have that desire to encounter what is good and what is holy and what is God, right? Even the wicked ones. And sure enough, when it comes to Jesus fulfilling this whole story from wisdom, That's what happens. All of those people finally descend upon Jesus and attack and beset him and mock him and kill him as we just prayed the stations, right? That hostility, anger, violence besets him. And he is quiet. It's always very striking in in the reading of the Passion how little Jesus says, it gets quiet. From his perspective, it gets quieter and quieter and quieter. He says less and less and less. And all the other noise builds and the mob saying crucify him, right? And accusations and judgment and humiliations, lots of noise around Jesus in the passion. And he gets quieter and quieter and quieter and just offers nothing but love even for the people who are attacking him and killing him. He remains still in the midst of all of that noise, right? That that, that he gives back love in the face of what is hostile and toxic. And sure enough though, ultimately of course, this is what everybody is really looking for. (laughs) The one who will love them, love us, unconditionally, without holding back anything, right? In my hostility to God or to what is good sometimes, God gives back love and compassion. Jesus gives back compassion. And that is enough to turn hearts, right? Even as the gospels unfold, Ultimately, I think about that, that one soldier that ends up getting referred to sometimes in the Christian tradition as St. Longinus. Did, did you know that? Do you know that one? Did you grow up with a, I never, I didn't get that till much later, but St. Longinus, that soldier who, who thrust that spear through the heart of Jesus, the one who is a part of the machine that kills him, that puts him to death immediately upon finishing that killing, he, something happens in his own heart that causes him to say, this was the just one. This is the one who came to save us. He makes a profession of faith immediately upon thrusting that spear through the side of Jesus. What? Why? How? What happened there? What's the mystery of what happened in that soldier's heart that, that moved him from being a part of the machine to kill the just one to then professing faith in him? What, what got into his own heart in that moment as he was piercing Jesus' heart? That's a beautiful and confusing reality to pray with, it seems to me. Or you think about Thomas as another version of it. Remember in the, in the wake after, after the resurrection, when Jesus showed up to be with those disciples in the upper room and, and gives them encouragement that he is alive. And for whatever reason, Thomas was gone that day. 
And then when they say, Thomas, you're not going to believe this, but he's alive. And his hardness of heart. And who knows what was going on in Thomas's heart. But I like to wonder about it at least when he says, unless I can put my hand in his side and feel the wounds in his hands and his side, I will not believe that hardness of Thomas. I will not believe. But what is it about those wounds of Jesus that, that catches Thomas? What is that? I don't know. Maybe it was something in Thomas, maybe Thomas's own discouragement or having gotten his hopes up to follow Jesus, that Jesus would be the Messiah, and then to watch him be humiliated and killed in a humiliating way. Maybe it was too much for Thomas to risk opening up his heart again. Maybe it was just too much. He already had his hopes up, and then the rug got pulled out from under him in, in this watching of Jesus go to his death. I don't know. I don't know what was going on in Thomas, but for some reason, he locked in on those wounds of Jesus. Unless I can put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And then that next time, as soon as he's brought and Jesus opens up those wounds to him, he goes from, I will not believe to my Lord and my God because of being offered the encounter with the wounds of Jesus. He goes from hardness to a radical profession of faith like that because Jesus opened up the wounds of his own side, of his own heart. He literally opened up his heart to him to reach in. Right? And that was enough to let the guard down around Thomas's own heart, it seems. You know, and those characters along the way that, are, that, can, become, that can be so hard and then be moved by encountering the heart of Jesus that is pierced. That's mysterious. <laughs> so there's the mystery of evil and the mystery of sin, but the mystery of the way Jesus continues to open up his own heart to us, even though not one of us deserve it. Right? Not one of us deserves that compassion from Jesus. Not one of us. Right? And yet, that's what he gives to us. It doesn't make sense that he offers his compassion to us. It doesn't make sense that in return for our selfishness or our orneriness or our hardness of heart that he offers a heart that is opened up in love. That doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense that when we do encounter his heart opened up for us, that our hearts get softened too and opened up. That also doesn't make sense. <laughs> and yet that's what happens. <laughs> that's kind of the mystery. I think that's one way of it, at least, of considering the mystery of our lives as Christians, right? There's a lot of confusing things that happen but the one steady still point is the person of Jesus who opens up his own heart to us, regardless of who we have been, where we are right now, all the ways that we stray, all the ways that we have hardened hearts ourselves sometimes. And the Lord gets it done, ultimately. I guess that's part of my takeaway from this mystery, is that in all of that confusion, the Lord is relentless in offering us his grace and his love. And he will get us opened up into his love and into his grace. And I might just conclude with a, with a version of this that I like to remember just for my own sake, if nothing else, but hopefully it's helpful for you. But when I, I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, I was born in 1971. And you know, everything in Phoenix is new. And I'm, I'm born after the Second Vatican Council. I didn't have any kind of, um, there was no kind of devotional life really that I grew up with, even though I grew up Catholic. It was, it was pretty, 
it's kind of cerebral, I guess, in a lot of ways, just bare bones, not a lot of great statues or stained glass or anything that I grew up with, not a lot of devotions. So anyway, that's just a little backdrop. But after I joined the Jesuits, I, I read a book from uh, Father Arupe, who was the, the Superior General of the Jesuits, and it was a, a, a series of essays that he wrote, or homilies really, about the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And I guess I never really knew anything about that. I mean, I knew who Jesus was, but the whole Sacred Heart devotion, I had no clue. But as he was reading it, or as he was, as he was kind of offering these meditations on the heart of Jesus that is pierced and on fire, and the source of hope for humanity. Something about the way he wrote about it really grabbed me, but it was still just a book. Then, later on, they sent me out, they send us out when we're Jesuit novices on experiments, they call them. <clears throat> they send you out for like six weeks at a time to see what happens. <laughs> One of the experiments is they give you a one-way bus ticket somewhere around the country and $35, and then you come back six weeks later and then see what happens. <laughs> Uh, and see if God takes care of us. And God took care of us every single time. That's one experiment. The other experiment was I got sent out to teach on an Indian, res the Lakota uh, reservation, the Pine Ridge Reservation, as was mentioned, in South Dakota. And I was out there, I was sent out there to teach high school just for one semester, though. And I don't know if any of you are teachers, but to be sent into a school in January in the second semester, midstream, not a good idea, right? But that's what they did. That was part of the experiment. So they sent me out to teach high school uh, just for one semester in January. And I thought, uh, well, this will be, I already had taught a couple of years and I figured I worked out all the kinks by that time and I, maybe I could hit the ground running teaching. But I also knew it was gonna be hard because it's a totally different setting among the Lakota people. And that's a place, if you know anything about that, that reservation, that was the place where Wounded Knee is, the last massacre of an Indian tribe by the U.S. Army. So historically, it's a place of great woundedness and, and, and just injustice and violence and harshness, really. Um, and I knew that there are a lot of problems. This is, this is the poorest reservation, even, even among reservations, this is the poorest one and, and just a lot of violence and a lot of despair, really, for a whole variety of reasons. So I knew it was gonna be hard, but I still figured, well, I could teach a little bit of religion at least in high school, and I'm gonna try to get across this mercy of God and the love of Jesus to these kids. I'm gonna try, because I had just experienced that in a new way myself, and I wanted to give that to these kids that I knew had a hard time in their lives. But the teaching was a disaster. <laughs> Every day was, got worse than the previous one. Right? They wanted nothing of it. Right? These kids that were hurting so much wanted nothing of what that I was, or at least the message that I was giving was toxic to them, <laughs> obnoxious to them maybe. And it did not go well at all. And when I would get home from teaching, I would go sit in that chapel that we had. We had a little tiny Jesuit community chapel and I would sit in front of that tabernacle and I, I think I was, I was in the chapel so I figured I was praying but I think maybe in hindsight I wasn't really praying. I was really muttering to myself and complaining to myself and mad. I was mad at these kids that weren't respecting what I was doing. They were rejecting the message. They were not respectful. They didn't do their homework. They didn't, all this kind of thing. So I was mad at them. Sometimes I would mutter about that. And then I would realize, I would know, well, it's not their fault. These kids have grown up in a really hard setting. It's not their fault. It's their parents' fault. They didn't raise these kids right. And then I get mad at parents for a while. And then I realized, actually, parents aren't even raising these kids. Almost all the kids are being raised by their gram grandmas or, or aunties. They're getting passed around by different people because their parents aren't intact to be able to raise them. And then I would get mad at that. And then I get mad at the whole system and history and the situation, right? And I'm just muttering. And then I also kind of turned it on myself, too. Well, maybe it's not any of their problems. Maybe it's my problem. Maybe I'm just a 
crummy teacher and I probably don't have a Jesuit vocation and I'm worthless and you know so this was my prayer in the chapel right lots of muttering lots of noise and lots of feeling sorry for myself well in the midst of that though day after day I would at least sit there but I saw in the corner of the chapel there there was one of these little just on a little pedestal one of those little statues of the sacred heart and again, I didn't grow up with that devotion. I knew it was Jesus, and for some reason he had his heart on the outside there, but I never really got it. <laughs> but I started to look at that statue for the first time, in a sense. For whatever reason, it kind of caught my eye, or in a deeper way, it got my attention. In part because Jesus was going like this, like, look here, right? <laughs> look here and then beckoning with the other hand toward me, saying, this is it. <laughs> this is the way that I live. This is the way that I love. And this is for you, too, if you want. <laughs> you don't have to, but I'm telling you, this is it. <laughs> and the way I live and love is with my heart opened up to the world. And as I opened my heart up to the world, I got pierced. I got beat up. <laughs> my heart got dinged up. My heart got pierced. And my heart is still also on fire. So that, the piercing of Jesus' heart, the bloodiness of it, that's what got my attention at first. But also the fact that it's on fire at the same time. I thought, I want, I want that fire. <laughs> but that fire was going out in me because I was feeling sorry for myself and feeling sorry for all sorts of situations and mad and whatever. But I wanted that fire, but I could do without the piercing part. <laughs> but the more I kind of just looked and just gazed upon, not really thinking about it, but just taking it in, taking in that image, it kind of clicked with me. These are inseparable. Having a heart that is pierced is life, <laughs> right? It's the way of love, and it's the way of Jesus. That's just reality. And a heart can be on fire at the very same time, right? In fact, maybe that's the only way a heart can be on fire, as if it has also been pierced and wounded and bloodied a bit, right? Somehow, that just got me in a, in a new way, right? in a different way, in a deeper way. And whatever it is that I was going through, whatever it is that I was muttering about, or the, or the pain and the suffering of these kids that I was teaching and the whole situation on that reservation, there was a lot of harshness, right? But I wasn't as, once I started to talk to Jesus about these things, instead of talking to myself about them, I got better. <laughs> my teaching didn't get any better. It's not like they loved my lesson plans all of a sudden, right? Nothing externally really changed. But somehow, interiorly, it got better for me. Because I think there was something like whatever suffering or woundedness or piercedness in my heart and in the hearts of these kids that I was trying to teach, whatever all that is, we are not alone in it, right? Jesus himself, God himself in the flesh has united himself to take on those piercings himself. So he knows what it's like. In fact, he goes through it with us, with me. Both the things that I do to myself or other people do to me, all of the confusion of that evil, all of the confusion of that sin, all of the confusion of that woundedness, he allows himself to be drawn into it and to take it himself so that he could be with us in the midst of it so that we would not be alone in the midst of it.
right? For real, right? So I am not alone, you are not alone in whatever those areas of, of piercedness of your own hearts, whatever those areas are, we're just not alone in it. And not only are we not alone in it, but somehow when we unite our hearts to his that are pierced, that helps the salvation of the world. You know, there's a, there's a line in the, in the, as you might recall, in the Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter one, verse 24, I think it is. Paul says, we, the body of Christ, the regular people in the church, the body of Christ, we in our sufferings, we make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. He needs us to unite our sufferings to his in order to help achieve the salvation of the world. That's strange. <laughs> his sacrifice on the cross accomplishes it, but he also needs us at the very same time to unite our sufferings on our crosses to his in love. And somehow, I don't know how, but somehow that's what we believe. Our sufferings united to his help to advance the peace and salvation of all the world. That's what we say in the third Eucharistic prayer at mass. Somehow the un un union of our sacrifice of our own hearts that are wounded for a whole variety of reasons. If I can make that gift of offering my heart to his, that somehow or other helps to accomplish the peace and the salvation of all the world. <laughs> so not only am I not alone in my suffering, but my suffering means something. And not just means something, means maybe everything. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but that's what we believe. <laughs> that's what we believe, that Jesus needs you when you are suffering to unite your heart to his. Jesus needs me to unite my suffering to his. And somehow or other, that accomplishes the salvation of the world, the redemption of the world, my own redemption too. So I might just kind of leave it there. And, and I don't know what you think about all that. There's a lot of, co there's confusion in there, but there's also simplicity <laughs> in our faith, right? And who, I don't know where everybody is in, in your own lives right now or what's going on in your relationships, in your own heart, your own health, or whatever you think of, whatever it is that's going on. Somehow or another, I think maybe the invitation for us, especially during Lent, is to bring that confusion perhaps, perhaps some pain, some frustration, some discouragement, whatever it is that we have, to somehow or another turn to Jesus, quit talking to ourselves about it and muttering to ourselves about it, and offer it all, all over to him and to say, Lord, I don't know what to do with this, but this is yours, right? And I know you have united yourself to mine, and somehow that's enough, more than enough. Somehow that is our redemption and the salvation of the world in making that union. So maybe just take a moment uh, and just ask the Lord to continue to speak to our hearts wherever it is that we need to be spoken to. To ask the Lord for his word of mercy in our lives and in our world and our hearts. Give us the grace to be confident in his desire to unite his heart to ours. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.